18th and Michigan Avenue. This is where the Arab community began more than a hundred years ago. Chicago's Arabic Quarter was located at 18th and Michigan and it was taking form just after the turn of the century. It continued to serve as the launching point for new Arab and Muslim immigrants through the mid-1940s. In the 1940s, it was centered around the Mecca restaurant at 1806 South Michigan, where Arabian food specialties were served and Arab merchants would congregate and share stories and find comfort. This corner was a major thoroughfare in the immigration of Arabs to America. In 1911, the Survey Journal in its four-part series on Syrians in America estimated there were 1,200 Syrians living in Chicago, compared with 6,000 in New York and only 56 in Duluth, Minnesota. There were 15 Arab-owned stores in the city. The largest American Muslim community in the United States at the time was located in Providence, Rhode Island. There were some 150 Muslims there, not all Arab though. Louise Seymour Houghton wrote for the survey, quote, in Chicago there are also three colonies resembling those of New York in gradation of living though not in size. The poorest is housed in the uncomfortable region near the railroad tracks, evidently chosen from consideration of rent. This was formerly one of the most disreputable quarters of the city. By 1910, three pockets of Syrian Arabs were living in Chicago, with the center recognized as being in the area of 18th and Michigan Avenue. Although the Arab settlers in the early days found homes throughout Chicago, it was perceived by many that a large concentration existed at this location. More than likely, it had to do with the few restaurants in Chicago that offered Arab food, which were located there in the area of 18th and Michigan Avenue. This is formerly one of the most disreputable quarters of the city and it still has a reputation among those who are ignorant that the entrance of Syrians killing off the saloon trade has driven away the disreputable inhabitants. This was the case in 1909. The property has recently been bought by the railroad and the Syrians who live there were removed to better parts of the city. The other colonies like those of New York are better standing in proportion as they are farther from the center. Most of the people who came here were men, usually between the ages of 18 and 35. Some of them were married. They'd come here and they'd, not to find new families, they'd leave their families behind in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Syria, but they would come here to see if they could earn a living in this great country of gold paved streets called America. Late in Mortimer wrote, you won't find any camels at 18th and Michigan. Chicago's small Arabic quarter is surrounded by automobile roll. This used to be a major area where car dealerships were once located and people would come from all around the Chicago area to buy their cars. If you can di digest such, there are several native restaurants serving near eastern delicacies which you're supposed to eat with your hands. Arabs sell tapestry and rugs, wholesale and retail. Many merchants who say they are Arabs because business is business are really not. You'll find no orgies out of the Arabian Nights here. Chicago's Arabs don't keep harems, and if they did, you wouldn't care to look twice at their women. They wouldn't be to your taste. The chief pastime is drinking thick black coffee and playing cards. I remember talking with Arab 
Americans who had come here during that immigration, most of them have now long passed away. But they used to talk about how Muslims and Christian Arabs would come together as they were single men living in apartment buildings here by themselves. And on Fridays and on Sunday mornings, Friday for the Muslim service, Sunday morning for the Christian service, they would get together and they would bring an imam who would travel around from small little warrens of Arab Americans, Muslims, and provide the uh, Muslim services. And the Christians would bring in an Orthodox priest or a Maronite priest who would do the same thing, travel around and visit the community and provide Christian services for these immigrants. Years ago in this area, two aldermen, Hinky Dink Kenna and Bathhouse John Coughlin, would hold their offices. And Arab American merchants would come there and knock on their door and for $10 would purchase a license that they would stick on their suitcases that they would then carry around with them as they peddled their wares to the many neighborhoods in and around this area. Some of those merchants who I interviewed years and years ago in the 1970s said that oftentimes they'd sit and chat with the aldermen and sometimes they'd even give them a cut of the money that they made. One of the first Muslim Palestinians to arrive during the early 20th century, 20s, 1920s, was Hassan Halim, who came here from Batunia, Palestine. I remember interviewing Hassan in the early 1970s, 50 years later. We had to go there for our permits to peddle merchandise from our suitcases, recalled the late Hassan Halim, the patriarch of a large family of Muslim Palestinians who immigrated to Chicago at the turn of the century and who also helped other Arabs as they immigrated to the city. We would meet with the aldermen there, Bathhouse John Coughlin and Hinky Dink Kenna. We had to pay them a registration fee. A small fee for them, personally then we could peddle our wares on the street. The permit would be fixed to the suitcases. The Arab peddler was an extension of the Arab merchant in the great souks or the open-air markets of the Middle East. The peddlers who came to America saw their profession as demanding as, they, as the work they left behind, except they found more opportunity here and less back home. Because it was strenuous work and required long hours of walking, carrying a heavy suitcase of merchandise, usually bedspreads, shirts, combs, and brushes, trying to sell their wares was difficult as peddlers. It was a major profession for the early Arabs in America. To go up to a home, your Middle Eastern face, a stranger, olive skin, black hair, mustache, suitcase, and try to get the usually white woman who was home during the day, her husband at work, to open the door so that they might look at the wares that were carried in their suitcases 10, 12, 16 hours a day. Arab merchants would joke in the evening at the restaurant, Shaharazad, Trying to get them to open was like trying to get God to open the door. Obviously some did, and many Arab merchants went on to become major businessmen in Chicago, in Illinois, and the United States. Today, a hundred years later or more, you won't see any presence or any sign, any marking that this was at one time an Arab American 
portal into the great American society. But what you will see is that years later, other people receive great accolades for all that they've done. Ironically, the only Arabic you often hear these days are coming from the cab drivers, most of whom who are Arab. The sign reads, proud to be an American on the window of a building on Michigan Avenue a hundred years after the Arabs have left. From 18th in Michigan, the Arabs migrated south and southwest. As more and more Arab Americans would come to Chicago, their movements took them to other areas, including Halstead Street. And I remember as a kid, coming here with my mother and father, Mr. Ziad's Bakery, one of the few Arab American stores where we could get Syrian bread and the ingredients to make Arabian foods. Halstead Street, they moved to the other side of the stockyards, to Ashland Avenue. For many years, through the 1950s and 1960s, Ashland Avenue became the hub of Arab Americans. A small group of Muslims settled in this area and opened a mosque on a second floor of a grocery store and bookstore. I remember coming here in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Today it's a Hispanic community, but back then you would see small little stores owned by Arabs. The Arab migration continued south and southwest along Ashland Avenue, down 51st Street. You can almost track them by streets. The migration was overlapping. They'd leapfrog over each other as they became more and more successful. Moving west down 51st Street, they'd head toward Western Avenue. And from Western, they settled at 63rd and Kedzie, which became a center of the Arab community through the 80s. Kedzie Avenue became the new magnet for Arab merchants. Some of the Arab merchants remained in the inner city as neighborhoods turned African American. But their families moved south, west, and west. Many of them moved their businesses. Although most of the migration was consisted of Palestinians, there were many, many Lebanese Americans, mainly Christians, who lived in what was called the Gage Park area, 
right around Kedzie and 55th Street. Names like Jage, George, Antone were very common, frequent people, who families, who would walk up and down these streets on Kedzie to bank at Tallman Federal Savings or attend the nearby Catholic Church. Once the hub of the Arab community in Chicago in the 1970s, extending all the way down Kedzie to 63rd Street and then west on, Ked on 63rd and Kedzie for at least a mile. This area, though, used to be one of the centers of political activity for Palestinians who would meet in this building, now a tailor and a hair salon. It used to be the banquet facility where meetings were held of the Arab American Congress for Palestine. I remember coming here in 1975, my very first meeting. Maybe it was 1974. Walking, parking my car in a nearby parking lot. Walking across the street. Wanting to find identity. Going into the meeting that was convened by Professor Ibrahim Abulughad, a professor of political science at Northwestern University. The professor held a political meeting here and would invite speakers for the Palestine Liberation Organization to speak to the community and give them hope. in Kedzie for many years through the 70s and 80s was the hub of the Arab community in Chicago. There was a community center right down the street where we would go for more meetings. The Jebha, the group that opposed the PLO, the Fatah group, would often meet there. Today this, these streets, once lined with Arabic language stores, have been replaced by Hispanic stores. Although there are still some stores that remain Arabic on this street, it won't be long before this community and the businesses here start moving further west too. One of the few remaining sections of Arab stores is this block at Spalding and 63rd Street. Restaurants, clubs, meat markets, bakery, grocery stores markets and the Nile restaurant. Down the street on 63rd Street, more Arab restaurants. The Jerusalem re restaurant, named after, of course, a famous Palestinian city. The Olive Mount, or Mount of Olives, imported food stores, named after a uh, very important Christian and Palestinian site in Palestine. Steve Shishkebab House is located in many places along 63rd Street and in Chicago. It's one of the best restaurants in the city. The owner, Steve Adawi, was very active in the Arab American community, a big supporter, and one of the earliest second wave immigrants to come to Chicago. From 
63rd and Kedzie, the community continued to move further southwest and west. One of the main groups of Arab Americans, Palestinians, slowly migrated steadily into two communities, Oak Lawn and Burbank in the southwest suburbs. My family moved to Burbank in 1968. Many of our cousins and relatives moved to Oak Lawn. I was one of the first Arab families in the Burbank area. Remember, I was one of the first Arab students at Revis High School. Today, Burbank and Oak Lawn are probably two of the communities with the largest Arab American populations in the Chicago southwest suburbs. Mostly Palestinian, but almost evenly divided between Christians and Muslims. Arab Americans slowly migrated into other communities like Bridgeview, Worth, Payless Heights. United Trust Bank was opened many years ago by Arab American investors, the only Arab bank in Chicago. Bridgeview became a hub for mainly Palestinian immigrants who were Muslim, congregating around the mosque that was built in that community 
today in Bridgeview and Burbank, all the way south down Harlem Avenue to Orland Park, you'll see symbols of Arab American community activity. Stores, signs, Arabic writing. The Arabic stores tend to follow the community itself and is a good marker of where the Arab community is today. I hope you've enjoyed this very brief slice of life of the Arab American community. It's just such a small part. There was no possible way in less than 30 minutes to really talk about the great achievements of Arab Americans. But I did try to follow the settlement of Arab Americans in Chicago um, around the turn of the century um, and how they migrated throughout the city. There are many great communities on the northwest side of Chicago, on the west side of Chicago, um, down in downstate Illinois around Peoria. Muslims and Arabs are an integral part of American society. We love this country and when we speak out and challenge things like foreign policy or if we say something that Americans disagree with it's not because we don't love America it is because we love America. We want to make it a better place too. Thank you very much for joining me on this episode of 30 Minutes. I'm Ray Hanania. You can get more information about the history of Arabs in America, of Arabs in Chicago, off my webpage at Hanania.com. Thank you very much, and I'll see you again. Bye-bye.